Welcome to the iPad Podcast, a weekly podcast from Max Future. Okay, this is Lex at MaxFuture.com, and welcome to episode 108 of the iPad Podcast. And I guess, uh, what's today's the 13th of August, Monday. So this is a chit-chat-free podcast all about iPad and iPad news, so let's get to it. It should be interesting. Okay, so the th- first thing I want to talk about is right now uh, the trial between Apple and Samsung is still going on in the Northern District of California, and it's quite a trial. Uh, it's before a jury, and basically Apple's claiming that Samsung violated patents relating to the iPhone and the iPad, and uh, you know I think uh, Apple has the upper hand. And uh, I think Apple's going to finish presenting its case maybe today or tomorrow, the 13th. And um, then it maybe goes to the jury next week, uh, closing arguments ne- next week. And it's very contentious litigation. Uh, you know, both sides are f- constantly filing motions, trying to get evidence in, trying to not get evidence in. But I do think that Apple has the upper hand in its claims against Samsung. And one of the things that, if you're looking at the video version of this uh, podcast that I'm looking at, is a key exhibit that Apple was able to get into the trial that I think is pretty damning and will maybe convince the jury to rule in Apple's uh, favor that that uh, Samsung violated Apple's patents and tried to copy both the iPhone and the iPad. And it's exhibit 44. And basically it was an internal document that Samsung created called Relative Evaluation Report on S1 iPhone, and S1 being, I guess, a Samsung phone. And um, so here's, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty lengthy document. If we go, let's see, if you go to thumbnail view here, uh, and it's a basically an item by item look by the Samsung people at the iPhone functions and what Samsung has to do to get its phone to be like the iPhone. And it's, it's incredible because it shows, you know, that, um, that they were trying to essentially copy almost item by item what's in the iPhone. So, for example, look on this uh, slide number three. On the left, they say the iPhone basic function. It says effective and efficient use of space shows keypad font and calendar schedule in a large view and on the right side for its own S1 phone Samsung r- r- writes has poor use of space for large LCD keypad and font are small and and schedule f- list field is narrow and it goes on in great detail and at the and um, you know if you go down to basic function memo it compares the calculator and basically points out that the iPhone calculator um, and the memo app when the phone is rotated either to the right or to the left it is switches to landscape mode and for Samsung's own device it writes um, as shown in the picture on the left it doesn't switch to the landscape mode when the phone is rotated to the right and so it says for description of improvements that Samsung, uh, the landscape mode should be supported whether rotated horizontally to the right or to the left. In other words, the conclusion is it should copy what Apple's doing. You know, and I can just skip to any slide here. And this was originally, I guess, in Korean and they translated. But let's take the uh, the basic function of the home menu. It points out that the iPhone cannot place duplicate menu icons on the home screen. And for the Samsung phone, it says causes user confusion because multiple icons for the same me- menu option can be placed on the home screen. So what is it right for improvement at the bottom? Need to modify so that duplicate menu icons cannot be placed on the home screen. In other words, exactly what the iPhone has. So it's it's almost like item by item copying what Apple has. Uh, for the adding bookmark input screen and the keyboard screen over overlap, um, it points out that the iPhone, everything is displayed on one screen. And the Galaxy, or whatever, the Samsung phone, it says the screens overlap. And the conclusion, the screen should not overlap. In other words, do what the iPhone has. For web browsing, it points out that the 
on the iPhone, it's easy to see the loading sign sign in the video loading screen because it's located in the center of the screen. So when a video is loading on the Samsung one, the loading sign appears at the top right corner of the screen while YouTube video is loading. So the screen below feels very empty. The conclusion is modified by inserting the text in larger font at the center of the screen to match the LCD size. So it's almost like line by line, like this is what iPhone has. This is why we have to change our user interface to be exactly like the iPhone. And, you know, presumably this is what they were doing with the with the iPad. So I think this document in particular, which is very lengthy and it goes through everything like um, the user interface for SMS messaging, for Wi-Fi, it's just very extensive. Like I said, it's a very lengthy document. Um, this is Exhibit 44. And I think this is the kind of exhibit that's going to really swing the day for Apple and its lawsuit against Samsung. So we'll have to uh, see see what happens. Now in terms of what kind of relief or damages Apple could get from Samsung, you know, one of my listeners asked me in an email, like, you know, what could Apple hope to get from this lawsuit? Well, Apple's claiming, um, you know, lost revenue from Samsung copying uh, these, you know, the iPhone and the iPad and is seeking damages in terms of the lost revenue. And I believe they get, if it's willful, there's some additional monies that Apple can get. You know, I think Apple's looking to get something like two and a half billion dollars from Samsung. And that's not, that's, you know, a lot of money for you and me, but it's not crazy amounts of Apple, you know, money for Apple. Apple, I think, made, has something like a hundred and sixteen billion dollars, um, you know, stored up. And it makes billions and billions of profit and a quarter, much more than that two and a half billion. So, you know, it's not like if Apple wins, the two and a half billion is going to just be like a huge, gigantic windfall for Apple in terms of profit. It'll, it'll certainly help the bot bottom line. But I think more importantly, what it does for Apple is it, it sends a message to Samsung that, you know, your copying of I iPhones and iPads is not going to be free. You're going to have to pay for it. And also, I believe that it strengthens Apple's ability to get an injunction on future violations because Apple has already got a preliminary injunction on the Galaxy Tab from Judge Co., which is a, a tablet device. And the Judge Co. could impose a permanent injunction permanently enjoining Samsung from violating these patents. So if Samsung does go ahead and come out with new devices that continue to violate this, Apple could go into Sa to to Judge Co and say, "Look, Samsung is violating the permanent injunction." So, a permanent injunction, which would not be something that the jury imposes, but that if the jury came back and found that Samsung violated these patents, the judge could then impose a permanent injunction, basically saying, "Samsung, you are ordered not to violate these patents." So. If Samsung goes ahead and continues selling devices that violate the patents, Apple could go running in and ask, ask um, Judge Ko to impo impose contempt sanctions, which could be monetary, further monetary awards. So it basically becomes like a club for Apple to use to make sure that Samsung doesn't continue violating the patents and doesn't make tablets or smartphones that look too similar to the Apple devices. So that's what I think Apple's hoping for the most is to sort of change Samsung's ways. So, you know, that that's I think going to be the biggest outcome for Apple. Now, one of the more interesting pieces of news that came out, uh, I guess in the last week or so since we had this podcast was that the Square, you know, which is that great program an app and device that works with the iPad and the iPhone made a deal with Starbucks so that you can now use your Square app to buy things and maintain an account with Starbucks. Now, if you're not familiar, Square has two different programs that are both free and that work with your Square account. One, one program uh, that Square makes allows you to pay 
through your app on the iPad or the iPhone uh, to any you know enterprise that uses the Square app to receive payment. So this is great, particularly with like coffee shops, because you can sort of walk in and they'll recognize you through your uh, app that you're in there, and you can just say put it on my tab, and it'll go through your iPad or iPhone on your tab, which is great. Um, but there's also it started off Square started off as like a little dongle that you put in your audio plug of your iPad or iPhone and it turns it into a device to accept credit card payments and you can still do that and um, it's a pretty cool pretty cool way to make payments or uh, have payments made to you so if you're like a a small store or if you're a mobile you know service provider um, or let's say you're just selling fruits or vegetables on the street or something else and you want to accept credit cards you could do that now through your iPad or your iPhone through Square. So Square partnering up with with Starbucks will further sort of expand Square's reach. But um, here's the thing: like you know, where's Apple going to go with this in terms of the iPad and the iPhone? And we know that in iOS six, there's already um, there's already you know a program in there or an application that looks like it's going to be used for making payments. So, you know, where is Apple going to go? So here's the thing. I think Apple needs to seriously thinking of going into some sort of credit card or banking business of itself. Uh, and I had a listener sort of, um, um, you know, I had a, I had a listener uh, ask me, like, you know, does it make sense for Apple to go into the banking business if, uh, you know, because of regulation and because it's such a despised business? place. Now here's the thing. I, I did write a post and um, this is what I said. I said Apple should create its own Apple Bank to facilitate the next iPhone or iPad being a mobile payment platform. I, and I go on to say I think Apple should create its own bank. A lot of people speculate that with the new iPhone and I guess iPad coming out or iOS 6 coming out in the fall, Apple will go into the business of mobile payments. I think Apple will consider going into that space, but the problem with that space is that credit card companies are still involved. Here is the problem. Credit card companies are still involved in all these innovative ways to make payments. That is a problem because their credit card companies continue to take a percentage of the transaction. So in the case of Square, Square allows you to process transactions using a Square app or even take payments using the dongle. But Square relies on credit card companies to process that transaction. Vendors hate credit card companies because the percentage and the fees that they charge the vendors are very high. Square gets vendors to use the Square app, but they do so by offering a very low rate that matches or beats the credit card companies. Square then has to give the credit card companies part of the transaction fee that, the, that Square charges to process the transaction. This leaves Square with very little profit or revenue from each transaction. If Apple goes into the mobile payment business, it needs to convince vendors to accept Apple's mob mobile payment technology. For Apple to convince vendors to take Apple's payment service, Apple will probably have to greatly undercut the fees and percentages that credit card companies charge and that even Square charges. This is where it makes sense for Apple to become a bank. If Apple took money directly from customers and deposited those funds into an Apple account, Apple could cut out the credit card companies. Right now, most people fund their iTunes and App Store account with a credit card. The credit card companies take a percentage of each transaction that customers um, pay through the App Store and iTunes. So if Apple became a bank, customers could have direct deposits from their bank or from their employer goes straight into a bank account with Apple. Then when customers make a transaction in the App Store, iTunes, or make a mobile payment on a new iPhone, Apple would not have to pay any fees to the credit card companies. Apple could then charge extremely low transaction rates to the vendors to adapt Apple's payment strategy. Because Apple would not be paying the credit card companies, Apple could charge vendors percentages percentage rates as low as 0.5% or 0.02%. But how would Apple convince consumers to use Apple as a bank 
Well, most consumers are very unhappy with banks right now because they provide very low interest rates and hardly any benefits. Apple could entice consumers to make deposits with Apple by offering better rates than any major banks currently do. Apple could also entice customers to deposit funds with Apple by providing other benefits like points or giveaways or all sorts of discounts with vendors who take Apple payments. Apple could also entice consumers to deposit funds with Apple by just making the experience so consumer friendly. That would be easy to do as most banks have horrible customer service. If Apple made the banking experience as pleasant as the experience of going into an Apple store, Apple would attract a lot of depositors. It totally makes sense for Apple to become a bank. It also makes no sense for consumers to use um, an Apple payment service that actually goes through a consumer credit card. Credit cards are antiquated and there's no reason why we should stick with old-fashioned American Express Visa and MasterCard. Both the consumer and the vendor will benefit by Apple cutting out traditional credit cards as the middleman in executing transactions. There already is an Apple Bank that is mainly based in New York City. Apple should just buy the Apple Bank and make the most modern, up-to-date, technologically advanced bank in the world. Now, the issue of the credit cards taking a cut of the transaction is, is very real. Uh, I went to Quora, and there was a, 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 an answer on Quora regarding how much Square is making. And the way Square works is Square is actually using credit cards, right? So apparently, there's something called the wholesale interchange rate. And basically, like, you know, a lot of banks issue credit cards, and then they have to pay a cut of that credit card fee, you know, to Visa or MasterCard or whoever. Visa or MasterCard. And there's a, a range of rates per transaction. So, for example, if it's a credit card swipe, there could be a rate you pay of, you know, 1.54% plus 10 cents uh, or as high as, you know, 2.95%. If it's key credit card keyed in, in other words, you punched it in, it's going to be a little higher rate, a minimum of, um, let's say, 1.8%. So the point is there's a range, and the low-end swiped wholesale interchange rate would be like 0.95%, and the high-end of swiped wholesale interchange rate is 2.4%. Um, and, you know, some big places, maybe like Walmart, have gotten lower rates but the point is a cut's been being given to for to visa or to mastercard so apple can really give an incentive to uh, both vendors and and um, users like consumers if it can somehow cut out the middle middleman and i was thinking about this you know the question is why would you know, why would Apple go into the banking business because it's such a reviled business? But remember, Apple is famous for disrupting industries. The cell phone industry has been a somewhat reviled industry, and a lot of people thought Apple will never go into the cell phone industry because it's so reviled and so difficult, and yet Apple find a way, found a way to disrupt it and disrupt the carriers. And my questioner said, look, also banking is highly regulated, you know, both legally and all sorts of regulators, but so is the um, cell phone industry. It's regulated by the uh, C the FTC. And Apple's famous for disruptions. And just look at how Apple is disrupting the cell phone industry, not just with the iPhone, but with um, iMessages, which allow you to make free text messaging calls, you know, or, or te text messages between iOS devices. So I was thinking this through some more. So Apple can't completely cut out the credit card because right now most consumers have a credit card on file with the App Store and the iTunes Store, and most vendors have credit cards. So Apple would want to make its iPhone and iPad payment service able to work with vendors that don't don't yet have a means to take payment except by credit card. Similarly, a lot of users haven't, you know, haven't hooked up their bank to um, to Apple, but I don't think that would be too hard to do because look at for look at PayPal. PayPal right now uh, allows you to hook up your bank account 
most people have their bank account hooked up to PayPal, not a credit card. And you fund your PayPal account with a bank account. So PayPal is sort of like a bank, and it's uh, obviously highly monitored. But Apple's already monitoring all its transactions in the App Store for fraud. And it wouldn't be hard for people to just directly deposit um, money with uh, with uh, Apple, or Apple could issue its own credit card. In other words, Apple could sort of bypass Visa and uh, MasterCard and American Express and just say, we're going to provide you with our own credit card. We're going to remake the credit card. In other words, you get a statement, you can buy stuff with it, and then you have to pay it. And if you don't pay it on, on time, there's going to be you know fees. But the point is, Apple doesn't need the middleman. And so what Apple could do at the beginning is have this payment service be a work with credit cards, but also just like you, you can have regular texting on your phone, but you can also use iMessages, you could also make it so that if you wanted to, you could fund your your um, your your account with Apple and, and deposit money and not use the credit card feature. And with with vendors, Apple could say, "Listen, you know, we're gonna we're gonna give you the means to accept payment by credit card or to bypass the credit card companies and pay directly." And the incentive, so it's it's sort of a, Apple has to work both sides. For this to be successful, Apple needs to get the vendors on board and it needs to get the consumers on board. And right now. Square, you know, is doing a good job of getting like sort of everyday sort of small vendors, particularly the ones who are remote, uh, on board. But it's not like their fees are so much lower than, um, you know, what Visa and MasterCard charge. Um, but Apple could basically say, listen, listen, um, vendor, if you buy an iPad that is built with our app and our credit card swiping device. Um, you can also take payment directly bypassing the credit card company from iPhone or iPad. And in those situations, your fee will be minimal, like, you know, one-tenth of what, what the credit card companies or Square charges, like just practically nothing. So why would Apple do that? You see, Apple unlike the credit card companies, unlike PayPal, unlike Square, it can make money even if it just breaks even from the, the uh, transactions because Apple's selling the hardware. If Apple makes the hardware like for this payment service to be essential, then a lot of vendors are going to pay for the iPad or the, you know, or the whatever the iDevice to take the payments, you know, because they, they would be willing to take it because they're not going to have to pay, you know, all these huge fees to Visa. So I think at the beginning, Apple is going to have their payment or would have their payment service be able to take credit cards. But also, just like you have iMessages in the iOS devices, Apple is going to be able to have direct payment. And Apple could offer the, the um, consumers a higher rate that let's say you know then um the banks do or the credit card companies do they could give all sorts of credits to buying additional free apps or free device or, or credit on some devices but the point is apple would be making its money on the hardware because more and more consumers would buy the hardware for this payment service and more and more consumers would buy the hardware as vendors for the vending service. So I do think it makes sense for Apple to go into this business. Maybe they'll acquire Square, or maybe they'll just develop their own technology like they seem to be doing. Now, if you didn't see it, there was quite a, a bit of a scandal last week when uh, hackers sort of hacked Apple and Amazon and um, totally sort of hacked into the life of Matt Honan, who is a writer for Wired magazine, and he essentially, because of the hack, he had his iPhone, I guess, and iPad and computer all wiped because someone hacked into his Apple account 
and um, he lost like everything. And, and, and he has a one-year-old child, and a lot of the photos they had on the iPhone and the iPad were wiped out. Now, um, you know, here's an interesting thing about that. Now, the thing to point out here is that all three are at fault, Matt Honan, uh, Amazon, and Apple, in my view. Now, Matt Honan, you know, he's upset mainly because he lost all his pictures of his daughter. But the thing here is he did not back up to another hard drive or to another, you know, computer or something his photos. He just had them on his one computer, and he didn't back them up. And you should always back up your photos and stuff like that, not only to the cloud and not only to a computer, but to another device like a hard drive. And frankly, for photos and family videos, stuff like that, you should also burn it to another, periodically burn it to another device and put it somewhere else, like in another, in your office at work or in, at a relative's house. Because things can disappear from the cloud. Someone can break into your home or your apartment and steal your computer or, or a hard drive that's backed up there. So he didn't have it backed up there. And, and, um, but here's what went wrong. So apparently, and he communicated with some of the people who hacked into him on Twitter, but apparently he's had a, low, you know, a great Twitter handle for a long time, I think MAT or something like that. And there were some kids or whatever who wanted to hack into his Twitter account. And the way they did it was via Amazon first. So somehow they guessed his email for our account at Amazon. And this is something I never heard of, but apparently with Amazon, you can call up and if you give your email, say, I want to add my credit card number to that account. And you just do it over the phone. So these people went somewhere and generated a temporary credit card number and they called it Amazon and then they hung up. And then when they, they called Amazon back and said, hey, I'm so-and-so and I, and I, oh, I know before this they found out Matt's stuff through who is finding his name, whatever, online. Then they called Amazon and they said, okay, I, for I forgot my password. And then they gave the last four numbers of the, of the credit card number that they just qu had added to Matt Horning's account. Now that's a little whacked out because Amazon should not be adding another credit card to your account until they verify that that credit card is actually matching the credit card that's on file in terms of the account holder. But Amazon didn't do that, and because he knew the last, the hackers knew the last four numbers of the credit card that they had called in, they were able to get into the uh, Amazon account, which then showed them the last four numbers of the correct credit card that Matt Honing had on file with Amazon. So then armed with those four last numbers of the credit card, for Matt Honing, they then called Apple. They knew his address from the Who Is search, and they had the four uh, digits of his correct credit card. And based on that, Apple allowed him to reset his uh, iCloud password. And then the hackers got in and used iCloud to get into, I guess, uh, Twitter. Uh, but also to wipe out and play mischief and remotely wipe his computer and his iPad and iPhone. Now, some people were like, well, why, should, why do you allow remote wiping of your computer? But a lot of people have laptops and MacBook Airs, and if you lose them, you might want to wipe your laptop or MacBook Air to get the stuff off. Um so it was a very unfortunate thing. Apple said that people didn't follow procedures, and Apple's now making it harder to change your account. Uh, but look, at a minimum, you shouldn't have your your email accounts cross referencing re referencing each other. Like you shouldn't have like your Mobile Me account be your Amazon backup account. Maybe you should create additional Gmail accounts to be your your sort of backup email for like Amazon or you know not have them all cross link with each other
Um, but anyways, this brings me to the next article. Now, an article came out today uh, on the 13th of August that does in a relate, way relate what happened to Matt Honing, and that is that um, MIT's Technology Review has an article out today entitled, The iPhone Has Passed a Key Security Threshold. And the iPhone security is actually, I think, identical to what's on the iPad. And the article points out that um, since the launch of the iPhone, Apple's security in terms of encryption for both the iPhone and iPad has greatly improved. And here's what's interesting. It says here, at the heart of Apple's security architecture is the advanced, the advanced encryption standard algorithm, AES, which it says is a data scrambling system published in 1998 and adopted as a United States government standard in 2001. And it goes on here to say, after more than a decade of exhaustive analysis, AES is widely regarded as unbreakable. The algorithm is so strong, it says, that no computer imaginable for the foreseeable future, even a quantum computer, would be able to crack a truly random 256-bit AES key. It says the National Security Agency has approved AES-256 for storing top-secret data. And apparently, the AES AES key in each iPad or iPhones is unique to each device and is not recorded by Apple or any of its suppliers. It says the company said in a security related white paper, burning these keys into the silicon prevents them from being tampered with or bypassed and guarantees that they can be accessed only by the AES engine. And so the article says what this means is in practice that when an iOS device is turned off, the copy of the encryption key in the computer's accessible memory is erased. That is why an investigator who gets a suspect's phone would have to try all possible keys, the task deemed impossible by NASA, the NSA, not NASA. And it goes on to say that the iPhone and iPad do keep a copy of the encryption key deep in flash memory. Otherwise, there would be no way for the device to recover data when it is turned back on. But that encryption key is, is itself protected by the user's pin lock, a code that must be entered before the device can be used. So it basically points out that if you use, but it says that because, um, because that the pin is, I guess, in the flash, um, it says the software must be run on the iPhone itself, limiting the guessing speed to 80 milliseconds per pin. So if you try all four digit pins, um, trying all four digit pins therefore requires no more than 800 seconds, a little more than 13 minutes to run this software that like, you know, creates all the brute force, uh, you know, attempts at figuring out your four pin, um, crack. Um, however, if the user chooses a six-digit PIN, the maximum time required would be 55 days. And if you use an eight-digit PIN, it would take more than 15 years to crack um, the PIN. So, you know, one advice here is if you, you should, if you have anything sensitive on your iPad or iPhone, you should probably use an eight-pin, uh, an eight, eight-pin, um, an 8-pin, um, you know, key password to get in and for automatic locking, or at the very least, 6-pin. Six, six so I wouldn't sit, stick with just the 4-pin the because the 4-pin can be cracked in um, 13 minutes. So the point is you do have a lot of encryption, and so that if you're using... Here's the thing. Maybe you should turn off the ability to do remote wiping uh, from your iPhone or iPad because if you have it uh, eight-digit password protected, your device is already encrypted and nobody can get into it. So all your stuff is safe anyways. You would only do the remote wiping is if your device was not password protected. So that's an interesting distinction. Uh, between the password, you know, in other words, all that your stuff is already encrypted on your device. And if you put a password on it, 
you know, they can't somehow get into it unless they, they, they bust the password. Okay, so one of the more exciting things that happened in terms of apps on the iPad is that uh, Amazon released and Apple accepted an Amazon Instant Video app for free on the iPad. So apparently this works with if you have a Prime account with Amazon, which I think costs like 70 bucks a year. Originally P Prime was set up so that you could get um, unlimited shipping, you know, for free, like I guess two-day shipping if you order from Amazon for cert most things. But Amazon at some point threw in free videos, um, uh, and now Amazon claims to have over 120,000 videos avail available from the Amazon Instant Video Store. And now with this free Amazon Prime or I Amazon Instant Video app, you can stream um, video that you have from your Prime account to, to your iPad. So this is huge. This further makes the iPad a great content um, viewing um, device. It says here you can stream thousands of titles available from Prime Instant Video at no additional cost with a Prime membership or watch over 120,000 videos available from uh, the Amazon I Instant Video store. So no, the 120,000 number is if you want to like rent or buy uh, videos. So I'm not sure how many free videos you have in, in Prime Instant Video. Uh, it says here you can download purchased and rented videos from your video library and uh, you can add videos to your watch list from a PC, Mac, or Kindle Fire for later viewing on your iPad. So one limitation is you can't select from within the iPad app the stuff that you want to watch. You have to do it from one of these other devices. Start watching on your iPad and resume watching right where you left off on a Kindle Fire, PlayStation 3, PC, Mac, or hundreds of other models of connected TVs and Blu-ray players. It says for now um, the AirPlay is not supported. So one downer to this thing is that you can't stream to Air, um, AirPlay and there's no search function uh, built in. But still, it's a big step forward to have this additional content because now between Netflix on this and our, our Aereo, A-E-R-E-O, working on it on the iPad and, and this Amazon streaming app, plus what Hulu Plus and other v video content, you just get incredible amounts of video on, on uh, this device. Now, how is our beloved iPad doing in the rest of the world? VentureBeat has an interesting article on August 8th saying that the iPad has a higher market share in China than the rest of the world. This is by John Co Cotier. He said, he's pointing to IDC's latest numbers. And uh, it says IDC's latest mem numbers show that Apple owns the global tablet scene. And uh, it says here that um, in China... Uh, analysis, analysis International says that iPad has almost a 73% of the tablet market, while in the rest of the world it has a 68% mar uh, share. So, look, anything over 60 is really huge market share. So I'm not surprised. I mean, you know, a lot of Chinese, in, when I was in China, I noticed they're really into premium premium stuff. I mean, they like Gucci. They like premium luxury, like luxury items. So if the iPad is the luxury market leader in the tablet market, the, you know, people in China are going to pay extra to get that. They're not going to go for the cheap knockoff stuff. So that's what's really interesting here. Uh, you know, China is still a very poor country, but people want they don't want to be second. They don't want to be third. They want like luxury in their lives. And the iP iPad and the iPhone are attainable luxury. And I've noticed that also standing in line in here in the United States and Apple stores waiting for the new iPhone or the iPad. There's a lot of people who look like they're, they're means challenged, but they want that iPhone or iPad because it's an affordable luxury. In other words, it's pricey. It might be five or six hundred dollars, but it's not like pricey like a home. It's not pricey like a car, and it does provide a lot of entertainment and value. And so I'm not surprised by those figures in China. 
Speaking of China, uh, one pretty despicable thing happened involving the iPad in China, according to ABC News. In an article that came out on August 10th, it said, Surgeon on trial over teens' kidney iPad trade. And it says here, Prosecutor, Prosecutors told the court in Hunan province that someone named Hei Wei approached a 17-year-old boy known as Wang and offered him $3,000 for his kidney. He paid a surgical team to remove the organ and sold it on the black market. Prosecutors say Hei Wei kept the rest of the profits to pay his gambling debts, and the teenager used the money to buy an iPad, but soon he became ill and suffered from renal failure. His family says he's too weak to attend the trial, and the defendants, including the surgeon who removed the kidney, are accused of intentional injury and illegal organ trading. They face up to 10 years behind bars. So I know the um, the iPad is pretty, um, you know, pretty much wanted in, in China, but I don't think people should be selling their kidneys to get it. It's pretty, pretty despicable. Now, it's most likely that on September 12th, Apple's going to announce a new iPhone, and a lot of people think also Apple's going to announce a smaller iPad, uh, maybe a 7 or 8-inch iPad. And ZDNet has a nice little article, which I agree with, by Sean Portnoy. Uh, it came out August 10th that says, Why would Apple make a 7-inch iPad the kids? And I totally agree with it. And basically, his whole point is that the kids market is going to be a big part of the mini iPad. And he said, you know, there was a survey done and most people said they're looking for, adults said they're looking for the iPhone 5 that's coming out. And only a smaller percentage wanted the mini iPad. But many said that they would want it for their kids. And I do think that it makes sense. It's perfect for kids. One of the, pro and it, you know, it's not the size of the screen. It's the weight. The I third generation iPad's kind of heavy. And it's, I think, heavy for kids. It's heavy for me. I'm an adult. Holding it with two hands is kind of heavy. And for kids, a lighter iPad that's maybe 8 inches is a, is a nice little compromise between the iPod Touch and the iPad. And it'll make it easier for gaming. I'm always a little worried when my uh, young kids pick up the iPad and they hold it with two hands because I know it's kind of heavy. It's heavy for me. So... I, I do agree with uh, Sean Portnoy on ZDNet. Another article from Time called Techland, I guess, column by a guy named Mac Matt Peckham, has another article attacking tablets in another way, saying, are tablets like the iPad poised to dethrone game consoles? Well, that's something I've observed already because, you know, my kids game a lot on the iPad, and I've downloaded a lot of games, and... Um, According to this article, some people think that's going to get even more like that. And uh, it says here that Savat Yurli, CEO of Crytek, the guys behind the bleeding edge PC shooter crisis, uh, confirmed in so many words what, what the writer has been saying for years. Ta tablet gaming is here, and it's clear and present threat to console gaming. And uh, apparently this guy Yurli said in an interview, quote, the current generations are dying out, and the longer we wait for the next generation consoles, the higher the likelihood that they could fall behind tablets in terms of being the first thing people reach for when time comes to play games. Tablets are putting pressure on the gaming industry and taking over in some ways, so that should be, be kept in mind. And I think that's true. They're just much more accessible. Um, you know, it's much easier for a kid to get in on an iPad than on an Xbox 360 or a PlayStation. So, and I think the iPads are only going to get, you know, faster and better and be able to handle more gaming. So, you know, I totally agree w with this article by Matt Peckham. Good point. Earlier I talked about the iPad in the Square app as a point of sales device, but it looks like even without Square, a lot of companies are using the iPad as a point of sales device. And 9to5Mac on August 2nd had an article entitled, AT&T uh, AT stores will start moving to iPad-based point of sales by early next year. So this is uh, interesting. I think you're going to see growth in the enterprise market by the iPad and uh, it basically says um, what does it say AT&T Apple's first carrier partner is planning to take these cues from Apple retail earlier I talked about the iPad in the square app as a point of sales device but it looks like 
even without Square, a lot of companies are using the iPad as a point of sales device. And 9to5Mac on August 2nd had an article entitled, AT&T uh, AT Stores Will Start Moving to iPad-Based Point of Sales by Early Next Year. So this is uh, interesting. I think you're going to see growth in the enterprise market by the iPad. And uh, it basically says, um, what does it say? AT&T, Apple's first carrier partner, is planning to take these cues from Apple Retail. So it's saying that it's taking its cues from Apple Retail in order to overhaul the way its stores work as well. And apparently the story says, currently all AT&T stores are equipped with insufficient counter areas, inefficient counter areas where employees work behind outdated computers. And uh, these computers run some software called Opus that functions as the point of sale system, as well as allowing employees to check inventory levels. So this is all going to change apparently, and um, it's already taken steps away from that sort of counter by deploying iPhones and tablets with stripped down versions of Opus. And it says the iPhones are, are have basic functionality. But according to this article, in the next two years, according to sources, AT&T plans to completely rid its stores of computers and counters, moving completely over to the iPad with feature complete version of Opus. This is, I guess, this uh, tracking system. So an AT&T spokesman told 9to5Mac, there are several stores currently using tablets in the store specifically to com complete accessory sales and certain account changes on tablet from anywhere in the store. We're working to expand the functionality available on tablets. So this is kind of a huge thing because AT&T is pretty massive and um, you know I just think the iPad is so flexible you're going to see more and more businesses use it uh, as a point of sales device uh, like a cash register or something for salespeople to show um, you know show products and that sort of thing so uh, I think we're going to be seeing more of this okay so Apple you know um, had that series of commercials come out during the Olympics regarding, you know, the geniuses. And I got a lot of bad, you know, reactions from a longtime Apple fans. They said it was too goofy and very Apple, un-Apple-like in terms of quality. And um, they sort of retired those, you know, genius commercials with the goofy genius guys. And But they came out with a new iPad commercial that is sort of straightforward and you know i think it's pretty it's pretty good it just shows using the different ipad apps and stuff and basically the narration goes like this read it tw tweet it be surprised be productive make a sale make some lunch make it movie night play a game or an old favorite do it all more beautifully with the retina display on iPad and it's you know it's a 30 second video it's on YouTube I have the link and it just goes back to the basics which are the strength of the iPad which is that it's so versatile you can do so many things with it and I think it's an effective commercial you know the fact that you can like make movies with it uh, you know tweet stuff um, you know just do a variety of things and that's what really is the forte and I think why people buy the device now we've seen a lot of sports teams adopt the iPad for play, but now CBS Sports reports that in college football teams are starting to use the iPad for playbooks. And the latest is Duke Duke University, uh, according to CBS Sports, by an article by Sean Bielowski. And it says Stanford recently announced that it had moved to electronic playbooks, but the Cardinals are not alone. Duke coach David Cutcliffe said Monday that each of his players has been issued an iPad playbook. It goes on to say, we are a fully digital with iPads, Cutcliffe said. We're without paper. Our players each have iPads. All of our playbooks are on iPads. They're itineraries for camp. All our videos they watch. So this is, you know, this is significant because, I, you know, Microsoft's coming out with the Surface in about a month or so, but you have so many different enterprise places like sports teams, football teams, college teams, 
And the article goes on to list like all sorts of college programs and uh, NFL programs that have adopted the iPad as a playbook. Um, so I think you're just going to see this trend continue. It's very, it's very kind of an exciting. We're living in a sort of transformation in terms of uh, the computing. Speaking of enterprise, a newspaper in England called This Is Somerset.co.uk. I guess it's about the town of Somerset, reports something that's very enterprisey, and that is the town crier of that town uses an iPad as a virtual high street, um, which becomes a reality in Somerset. And it says here, uh, the historic city of Wells got a shot of modern technology yesterday. This is on August 10th, 2012. As the traditional scene of its town choir swapped his parchment for an iPad, so instead of reading from a piece of paper, he's reading from the iPad. It says, the spectacle of the high-tech device backed by the city's honey stone walls was to launch an online shopping fight back on the My High Street site with 50 shops from Wells and Castle Carry, Somerset. And will continue across the UK as soon as individual high streets can gather a minimum of 10 shopkeepers to participate. So... You know, I guess they were protesting, it sounds like. It says here, Wellstown crier Len Sweels showed the city is looking to the future as he substituted an iPad for his traditional parchment scroll to announce the launch yesterday. Traders in Wells and Castle Carry are the first to sign up to My High Street, pioneered by Wells toy shop owner Leo Yagab I don't know, Gayabi. But anyways, you know, it's it sounds like it's a gimmicky thing. But the point is, we're in a modern age, so instead of a, a paper scroll, the town crier is using an iPad. Well, with iOS 6, a uh, full blow on Siri comes to the third generation iPad, but looks like Google is going to also bring Siri to the iPad. And uh, Mashable report reported a story that's gotten wide press, which is that uh, Google Voice Search is coming to the iPad pretty soon it, and it says here watch out on Mashable's website watch out Siri Google is bringing its voice search app to the iPhone and iPad and it says as with the Android version the app taps into Google's knowledge graph function to consider the user's location and context of what is being searched uh, and then it goes on to say that this means the app can suggest films at nearby cinemas when users ask what movies are playing this weekend or understand that a search for Rio could mean a city movie or casino. Um, so it says that uh, the Google Voice search app is currently available for Android on the Google Play Store but will come to Apple's App Store in the coming weeks. And so it's going to be kind of similar to Siri. Um, it says here, comparisons with Apple Siri are bound to be made, not at least because both apps can respond to direct questions, but in reality, Google Voice Search is some way off its Apple rival. After all, Siri is able to search and carry out other functions. So, you know, it's not going to be as, I guess, as wide-ranging as, um, as Siri, but it looks like Google do does want to have a, a piece of the... Uh, you know the action on the iPad. Okay so Cartoon Network has upgraded its free app to version 2.0 and I think this is a pretty significant upgrade. It says here now you can watch video and play cool games all in the same Cartoon Network app. Turn your device to flip instantly between watching and playing and on the iPad you can even use the split screen mode to watch and play at the same time. The more you watch and play, the more DNA and energy you can earn to unlock awesome collectible cards of your favorite Cartoon Network characters. So this is interesting because Cartoon Network has been a really good, you know, app to watch sort of video content, a cartoon from the, from that network. And now they've done something kind of clever, which is they're going to allow you to play games at the same times as you watch uh you know, live TV streams from the network. Um, so, look, this is another one of these great apps that make you, uh, uh, you know, 
love to use the iPad as a television. It says here, um, note the Cartoon Network live stream follows the Eastern Standard Time schedule. Uh, and I don't think you need to have actually a cable account to see this stuff. It just works without one. Um, it says the app only works with iOS 4.3 and above. Uh, but look, I always like the, the first version of this, and I think it's going to be kind of fun to play games, particularly for your kids, as, as they're watching these cartoons. So check it out. It's a free upgrade cartoon network. Just download it or upgrade it if you already have it. Okay, so if you blog on WordPress or Blogger, there's a actually if you have if you blog on um, WordPress, there's a new WordPress iOS app which uh, has like an, an update. What's well, actually it's been around, but it's been updated, and it brings new UI and features. And TUAW.com talked about it, but um, basically version 3.1 of the free app, according to TUAW, brings a new look to the universal application. There's a sidebar for quickly navigating through the site and sliding panels to navigate and uh, the, the app can be used in landscape mode which I guess makes a lot of people happy I don't think it was there before and they've updated color and graphics so look I don't post using WordPress but it looks like the WordPress app if you if you have a blog on WordPress has been significantly updated so you should check it out its version 3.1 ever use the iPad with, for your kids in the car you know you, you they usually hold them while they're sitting in the back seat but what if you wanted to sort of embed the iPad in the back of the seat, the front seat so that you know they could sort of view it like they do on airplanes like you know on Virgin well tuaw.com has a very positive review by Stephen Sanday of something called the X Doria drive in iPad now I haven't used it but he gives it a very good plug it's only like $39.99, but it looks like a pretty secure little case with like a, a pouch for accessories that sort of is easy to strap around the um, around the, the seat, uh, the front seats, so that they're in the back of the front seats. And uh, it's called the X Doria Drive-In iPad. Uh, so check it out. I have a link to TUAW.com's article and it looks pretty interesting now over at USA Today they had a very positive review of another navigation app I have a link to that review of USA Today but the app is kind of intriguing it's called Copilot Premium HD USA and it goes for $15 $14.99 and basically gives you 12 months free active traffic service and what's interesting about it, it's a pretty massive app. It's 1.47 gigabytes for the iPad uh, as well as the iPhone. But it, it, it downloads a lot of that GPS mapping information for the U.S. onto your iPad. So apparently it works better because it's not constantly looking you know, up into the Internet or to the GPS. It says, turn your iPad 3G or 4G into a high-performance GPS system loaded with advanced navigation features. This HD version features a split screen navigation view designed exclusively for the iPad that combines 3D or 2D maps with non distracting turn instructions. So, Engadget, according to the site here, gave it five stars as did TUAW and Mac Rumors. So, I think the, the big thing is it has premium offline maps with free updates. It says it has a complete map of the USA stored on your iPhone or iPad and you can m navigate with a mobile signal or using uh, without using a mobile signal or using your uh, data plan so that's pretty cool and it says it has the safest GPS on the road it has unique directions only driver safety mode which only displays a map close to turns for minimal distractions and uh, automatic day night mode switching reduces sc screen uh, glare you know it's pretty cheap there's additional in-app purchases for fuel prices I guess it gives you real-time feeds on fuel prices a map of uh, that's seven dollars and ninety nine cents map of Canada is four dollars and ninety nine cents and having active traffic 
Um, so this is looks really like a very powerful navigation app. Um, I know I like the fact that you've got this split view. It says there's 3D and 2D map views, trip status displays, and the social networking, Twitter and Facebook status updates, find my car, local web weather information, and much more. So it's very rich. Let's see, the reviews here. Well, the first review I see is one star. Somebody says it's only $20, but I feel like I've been ripped off. The map is years out of date and inaccurate as well. The search can't find my home, which was built six years ago. The map shows my street connecting to a, st a state road. It doesn't connect. So that's unfortunate, and that's on a new update. Um, hmm. So the before the update, the reviews were, I don't know, some gave it five stars. Some people gave it two stars. So it got mixed reviews. So, uh, you know... I don't know. On one hand, USA Today loved it. I haven't used it. Finally, I want to make a reference to a major upgrade to one of my favorite apps. It's PDF Expert. Now, PDF Expert's a $10 app, and it's great for annotating PDFs, Adobe PDFs, filling, marking up PDFs. One of the reasons I liked uh, um, PDF Expert is that it supports hyperlinking. So you can hyperlink uh, within a PDF to other PDFs and those hyperlinks that are in the same folder you know of PDFs will work on the iPad which is pretty phenomenal but recently they did something very interesting PDF experts version 4.2 now has presentation mode which allows you to connect your iPad to a projector or I guess even use airplay and you can now call out uh, and highlight sections of the PDFs. And this is sort of like there are a lot of several apps that lawyers can use to do trial presentations or anybody doing like a, you know, some sort of presentation. And now within this app, you can go to that view. Um, it says here, combine content from PDFs, images, and now it supports videos. So you can you can dump videos into this app and show the videos during your keynote and you can even add notes and comments which will become visible as you're uh, marking up your presentations and it says all your annotations are shown on the screen as you make them so you can write down a remark or make an illustration atop the slide you can also there's a focus tool which can you can highlight an area quickly and it just focus it, focuses it. So it's very powerful, and I've played around with it, and I really like it. And even without this, it's a, it's an incredible app. It's it's very stable, PDF expert. It's great for like I use it a lot. I, I recently refinanced my mortgage, and I signed a lot of documents in the 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 PDF expert. Um, program on the iPad. I would just open the PDF from the bank and it has a great signature tool where you can store your signature but you can also then add in on the fly other people's signature and then flatten it and send it to the bank. So it's a great app. I highly recommend it. PDF Expert. So check it out. Okay, so that's it for episode 108 of the iPad podcast. Thanks for listening. You can support the podcast by going into the iTunes store, the app store, and giving it a positive review or going to the maxfuture.com website or to the YouTube video channel and giving it any sort of positive feedback would be greatly appreciated. So thanks for listening and see you next week. This has been a Max Future Production.